Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. Welcome to the NOAA Central Library Seminar Program. We provide an educational forum for the for presentation of ideas, research, updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Katie. Please note this presentation is being recorded and your name, email, and questions will be shared with the presenter after the fact. As an attendee, you are muted, so please place all your questions or your comments in the question panel. There is no live chat feature, but if you do have a comment you would like shared, place that in the question panel. Uh, questions will be asked at the end of the presentation. If you have a technical issue, such as no audio or visuals, please try logging off and back on, as that solves most issues, not all, and I apologize if that does not solve your issue. Uh, also, there may be some smaller tables or graphics seen in this presentation today, so please note that on your screen you have the ability to zoom uh, or remove the webcams or uh, split out the screens. There are all those options along the top bar of your GoToWebinar window, so please use those as needed to get a closer look at this presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Zhang, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar on BEA Satellite Accounting and the Marine Economy Satellite Account. I'm Jennifer Zhang. I'm an economist with the Performance, Risk, and the Social Science Office, um, or PRSSO. And I have been with the BEA and NOAA uh, Marine Economy Satellite Account team since it started. Today's webinar is the second part of the Economic Input Output Modeling Seminar series that uh, PRSSO is organizing. These seminars will provide the opportunity for uh, NOAA social scientists and policy analysts to learn about the concepts and available models and uh, best practices caveats of this topic. There will be uh, more seminars coming up next month and in October on uh, in-plan, Remy models, and some case studies. If you or uh, if you know anyone who's not familiar with input-output modeling and uh, interested in this topic, we'll have sessions in late October that will provide an overview on the most basic concepts and what we can do with it, the comparison of uh, available our models. Uh, so uh, you're, you're invited to join that webinar too. And today's webinar will provide an in-depth walkthrough of the creation of the NOAA and BEA Marine County Satellite Account using a stylized version of BEA's satellite accounting processing. For the past four years, NOAA and BA have been working together to produce statistics on the nation's marine economy consistent with the national accounts through the creation of a Marine Economy Satellite Account, or MISA. On June 8th this year, NOAA and BA released the first official MISA statistics. These statistics take a deep detailed look at the economic performance across 10 sectors representing businesses depending on the nation's ocean, coast, and Great Lakes. Um, and we have data available for years 2014 to 2019. And it shows the marine economy supports a diverse array of economic activities, including recreation and tourism, fishing, transportation, power generation, professional services, and research and education. And today's uh, speaker is Connor Franks. He's an uh, economist with the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, he has been an economist with BEA for five years and specializes in input and output accounting. He has worked on a variety of satellite accounts, including the outdoor recreation satellite account, the marine economy satellite account, the space economy satellite account, and et cetera. His work on satellite account ranges from research and development of estimates, technical oversight, uh, public outreach, and development of publication materials. Before we start the presentation, I want to give thanks to all our BEA colleagues and the NOAA MISA team, which include um, 
um, the Office for Postal Management, um, OAR, and uh, PRSSO, and our academic contractor partners who made this account available. And special thanks to Connor who summarized um, this very comprehensive concepts and the process in a short presentation. And now, Connor, uh, it's yours. Thank you, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, so, like Jennifer mentioned, my name is Connor Franks, and I'm going to be presenting to you a stylized walkthrough of BEA's satellite account estimation process. Um, so, if you joined us for the previous webinar, we went through the uh, basics of supply use, the supply use framework, and input output accounting from BEA's perspective. And then we talked a little bit about what you can do with some of that. So, we're going to switch gears a little bit today. And we're going to take a deep dive into our satellite accounting process. Um, so here is a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to start with a very brief recap of session one, just so we can refamiliarize ourselves with some of the concepts that we're going to be taking into this session. And then we're going to go over how we put together a satellite account using the supply use framework that we covered in the previous session. Um, so. Without further ado, here is a brief recap. Um, so things that you need to keep in mind during this session is that the supply table is going to show what is produced within the United States and who produces it. And it also includes a bridge to show how commodity output uh, transforms from basic to purchaser prices when we go ahead and add in those retail and uh, wholesale margins and then the transportation costs associated with uh, moving the goods and services around the economy. The use table is going to show the details of the production process of industries and then the consumption of goods and services by their final users in the final uses section of the use table. And then finally, the requirements models that we covered show the relationship between demand and output and can be used to show how an increase in final demand will cause changes to output. Um, so just some key concepts to take out of session one, uh, particularly related to the use table is that we have six main categories of final demand, which are listed here at the bottom. Um, so those are gonna be important when we start talking about how we transition from a national supply use framework into a satellite account. And then finally, we also wanna remember that intermediate inputs or II is the goods and services that are used in the production of industry's output. Um, so before I dive into how we produce satellite accounts in detail, uh, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page because I realize that not everybody knows what a satellite account is for BEA. So BEA, or at least the National Directorate at BEA, has what we refer to as our core accounts. These are going to be things like the uh, National Income and Product Accounts, or the NIPAs. There's going to be things like our Supply Use Framework and our GDP by Industry Statistics. Basically, they describe the national economy as a whole. So with the core accounts, we also have satellite accounts, which sit sort of adjacent to the core accounts. And typically, they build up off of the core accounts. And there's two main types of satellite accounts within BEA. Now, these can obviously be broken down into further detail. Um, but for this session, all we need to know about is these two main types. The first type is what we'll be talking about today, which I like to think of as supply use satellite accounts. The supply use satellite accounts are used when we want to highlight an area of economic activity that isn't typically easily noticeable within our core accounts. For example, um, the core accounts use the North American Industry Classification System, or NAICS, in the way that they classify economic activity into industries. Now, there are some economic activities spread across a variety of different industries, such as the marine economy. Now, the marine economy, as Jennifer mentioned, can cover things like recreation, fishing. There's some construction uh, going on with the dredging of harbors or beach nourishment. And so it's going to be spread across a variety of different industries, and it's hard to highlight it in our traditional core accounts. So what we do with these satellite accounts is we tease out the marine portion from the core accounts aggregate it into some new sectors or activities and present it in a unified package where you can really see what is going on within the marine economy 
And so all of the data that's in the marine economy estimates is also in our national core account estimates. But we've teased it out and we've re-aggregated it and put it together in a, in a certain way in order to better highlight things that are uh, traditionally hidden by the industry classification systems. So that's why we kind of refer to these as satellite accounts, because they don't actually change the core accounts. They are really just sort of an augmentation or a repurposing of those core accounts to highlight specific things. The second type of satellite account that we can find at BEA is what I think of as a research satellite account. Um, so a good example of a research satellite account is that at one point in time, BEA did not capitalize research and development activity. Instead, we categorized it more as an intermediate input into the production process of industries. Now, as uh, international guidance kind of shifted to, towards the capitalization of research and development, BEA implemented an R&D satellite account, which was almost exactly identical to our traditional core accounts, except that in that satellite account, R&D had been capitalized rather than treated as an intermediate input. So the benefit of those research satellite accounts is it allows us to concurrently produce both the core and the satellite accounts. So you can, users could see how the capitalization of R&D was going to affect the estimates within the core accounts. And so we could get feedback from users. We could refine our methodology while we were doing the research satellite account until we had all of our uh, I's dotted and our T's crossed and we felt comfortable incorporating that capitalization of R&D into the core accounts. So the research satellite accounts are used as sort of a testing ground for new methodologies and to get feedback from users on what we are doing. And then we'll eventually, if we decide that they're of the, the high enough quality, will be incorporated back into the core accounts. Whereas the supply use satellite accounts that we'll be focusing in on today are more of a standalone product where we're taking out some value within the supply use tables and the core accounts and we're re-aggregating it up to highlight a specific type of activity within the, the national economy. So that's a, a brief, brief background on what satellite accounts are. And so now let's get into the nuts and bolts of how we put them together. Um, so, like I mentioned before, essentially what a satellite account doing is re-aggregating economic activity that's already uh, in our core accounts. So the main thrust of this is going to be separating economic activity that we think is in scope from commodities. And we do that with different types of what we call partials. So BEA keeps uh, estimates on roughly, I think it's somewhere close to 5,000 different commodities that are produced and consumed across the United States economy. So the core of what we try to do in a satellite account is figure out which of those commodities are in scope. So for the marine economy satellite account, we went through that list of commodities and tried to figure out which of these commodities are marine related. And that can be either wholly marine related um, or it could be only partially marine related. Say boats is a good example. Some boats are marine related, but some boats are used primarily for freshwater. So the challenge here is going to be splitting out how much of a particular commodity is in scope to the satellite account, how much of it is marine related and how much of it is non-marine related. And so that's going to be this first type of partial here, these direct research partials. That's kind of the first step in a satellite account. And it's what the NOAA and BEA team spent a large amount of time doing. Um, and so that process, I'm not going to get into it too much, but that process is trying to track down source data that can help us make those determinations about how much of a commodity is in scope and how much of a commodity is out of scope. And so that is probably the bulk of the work of a satellite account is trying to go through that process, collect various different source data to try and break out these commodities. Um, but what we're going to be getting into today is what happens once that step is done. Once all of the research is done and we've created our direct research partials for the commodities that we think are in scope, what does BEA's processing system do to generate the actual results and the estimates that we publish? So there's two major things that are going to happen once we get these direct research partials and we, we kind of feed them into our processing system. 
The first is that we're going to create primary partials. And then the second is that we're going to create what we call industry partials. Both of these are applied to gross output. And then the first is going to be applied to final demand and sometimes intermediate input. So that harkens back to the six major categories plus II. So keep those in mind as we move through this uh, presentation. So we've created our direct research partials. We've spent, and I think, you know, a few years creating them and refining them, and now we're going to feed them in our, into our system. So the first step of that processing is to create a share for each item in final demand category, um, such that the share for an item is the ratio of that item's purchases within final demand to all other purchases of that item. So let's, let's break down this chart a little bit in terms of the last session. What we're looking at here in this gray box for levels, that's going to be the final demand section of the use table combined with the intermediate input section of the use table. So if we look at this first row, tint is your item. So that's the commodity that we are putting a partial on. And your activity here is specific to satellite accounts. So the activity, the best way I can describe that is the activity is a basket of commodities, a basket of goods and services that we think are all related to a certain type of activity within the satellite account. So for the marine economy satellite account, we might have an activity called water transportation. And so that's going to include all of the goods and services that go into shipping goods over the ocean or over the Great Lakes. Um, and so the activity is sort of like creating a new industry in a way, because we're grouping up a basket of goods and services that are related to one specific type of activity within the satellite account. Um, so the share of final demand slash intermediate inputs over here is a, a very simple calculation. We're just taking this 20 to get this 0 0.019, we're just taking this 20 and dividing it by the sum of this row. And so that's just getting sort of a weight. How much of this commodity is purchased in intermediate inputs in terms of a ratio? How much of it is purchased in PCE? And so that gives us sort of a weight. We're weighting this item by final demand to create this primary partial. So the next step to create a primary partial is we take the raw partials or the direct research partials that the NOAA and BEA team put together, and we're going to create one single primary partial from the raw partials and the final demand weights that we calculated in the last slide. And so the primary partial for an item is going to be equal to a partial that we put in, so for II, we have zero, so let's move to PCE. So for PCE, we have a partial of one. We think all the purchases of tint in PCE are in scope for this satellite account, whatever it is. Um, and so we're going to multiply that by the final demand weight and get some value. When we do that across all of the partials and all of the final demand categories, we can sum them up together and get this primary partial. And so the primary partial is weighted by final demand. So when we apply it to gross output, we are essentially collecting all of the various different shares um, from the use table into gross output. And the reason being why we want to be able to weight this by final demand is that if you look, say, on voting down here, you can have different partials depending on the type of transaction. So in this situation, we think that 75% of this particular type of motorboat, if it was purchased in PCE, we think 75% of that would be in scope. But we only think 25% of it would be in scope if it was purchased in private fixed investment. And so the different types of transaction, depending on your item, can have different direct research partials applied to it because it's a different type of transaction. We think there's a different purchasing pattern and that the intended use for those items is slightly different depending on who's purchasing them. And so that way, the, that is why we want to be able to weight these primary partials by final demand so we can capture those different purchasing patterns um, within the final demand section of the use table, within PTE, PFI, or, or Gov. We want to say, you guys are a different category of users, and so you have different use patterns, and we want to be able to incorporate that into the satellite account estimates. 
So we have our primary partials that were created using the direct research partials um, from the NOAA BEA team for the marine economy, say. The next step is that that only gives us the basic value output for the partials that we created. But we also know that when you say buy a tent, you're not just paying for a tent. You're also paying for the retail margins. You know, if you buy, go to Walmart and you pick up a tent, you're not just paying the price that it, that it costs to produce that tent. You're also paying for the price that it, it costs for Walmart to purchase that tent from a wholesaler and a wholesaler to purchase that tent from the manufacturer. You're also paying for some of the transportation costs that it that it uh, cost for that tent to get from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to Walmart. And so we're going to need to pull in the margin values on these items. And so that leads us to the first type of margins. There's two major categories of margin types or margin partials within BEA's uh, database. The first is what I call one-to-one -one margin partials. These are typically things like transportation costs. So air transportation, gas, pipeline transportation, rail and truck and water transportation, all just have a single item code associated with them in BEA's accounts. So all of the air margins are sort of aggregated into one single item code in gross output that's just air transportation margins. So for that, we have these one-for-one -one margin partials. And the process to produce those one-to-one -one margin partials is first we're gonna find total margins attached to an item. So this in scope total column here is going to be the summation of all of the margins attached to tents. So we've got some air, some rail, truck and water margins, and the vast majority of this $867 million worth of margins is wholesale and retail margins. Um, but for right now, we're just gonna go ahead and sum up and get the, a total of $867 million in margins are attached to the tent item. And we're going to apply this 0.997 to each one of these margin categories. If you recall, that is the primary partial for the tents that we produce. So it's the weighted final demand primary partial that we produced using those direct research partials. So we're going to apply that primary partial to all of the different types of margin categories here. And then we get in scope margin, uh, in scope margins for tents. So we think that there's about a million dollars worth of air margins that's in scope to the satellite account here. So the next step here is to turn that into a single margin partial for this air item here. So the way that we're going to do that is just sum up all of the air margins attached to the items that we think are in scope and then divide it by the total air margins found in BEA's database. So basically what we're doing is we're collecting all of the air margins that we think are attached to items or that we know that are attached to items that we think are in scope to the satellite account, summing those up and dividing it by the total amount of air margins across the, the national economy. And that's going to give us a partial that's saying this much of air margin output is associated with outdoor recreation or marine economy activity within the United States. Um, and so for the one-to-one -one margin partials, it's rather easy to do that because we only have one item that represents air freight margins. And so we can just sum up all of the air margins or all of the water margins and do that very simple calculation to generate a partial that we can apply to that item code that represents all of the in-scope margin activity. Um, so one assumption that we are making here is that in scope activity will follow the same basic margin distribution as out of scope activity. In other words, what we're saying is that if you buy a fishing pole intended for marine use, you're going to pay generally on average the same margins as you would if you bought a fishing pole intended for freshwater use from the same place. Um, 
So that assumption doesn't seem too out of the ordinary for me. I think it's a fairly weak assumption that we're making there. Um, so I think it holds up fairly well. So the next section here is the wholesale and retail margins. Now these get a little bit more complicated than the one-to-one -one margin partials. And the reason they get a little bit more complicated is because we have different types or different properties within wholesale and retail. For example, if you go to Walmart and buy a tent, you'll probably pay a different margin than you would if you went to REI and bought the exact same tent. Um, so we know that there's different properties within retailers. Not all retailers are charging the same margins on the same things. Not all retailers are even selling the same things. So we know that there's different properties within wholesale and retail trade. And so our BEA system is designed to incorporate those different properties and properly add, add, um, allocate out, excuse me, the margin value associated with those to the proper items. So we need to account for that in the satellite accounting system as well, because we are sort of resting upon the core accounts or the underlying input output tables at DEA. We need to make sure that we're pulling in the proper margin codes and the proper uh, transactions um, when we're switching over from a national to a satellite account view. So this first slide essentially is a lot of words to describe a very simple calculation. Um, what we're doing is we're finding a weight of this transaction type for A, for example. So what we're doing is, is we're taking this total value here. These are the total margins associated with a transaction type A. And there's three different item codes. We can think of those three different item codes as three different stores, for simplicity's sake. So you've got three different stores. They all sell one of these items, one of these, you know, these types of transactions, but they all charge possibly different margins on them. So it looks like store one is charging more margins, store two is charging a medium amount of margins, and store three is charging the least amount of margins on these. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a weight across these. And so that's just as simple as taking this 1,400 or this, this 1,000 and dividing it by 1,400, this 250, so on and so forth, so that all of these weights are going to sum to one across the items for this transaction type here. Um, so that is how we find just the, the what we call here A1 weight. This 42001 is, is item code one. Um, so we've got one, two, and three, or it's that store one, store two, store three. So we're then going to apply that weight to the in scope. So right now we're just going to focus in on wholesale margins. So we're going to apply that weight to the in scope wholesale margins, which we found earlier. So let's take this 385 number here. We've got three different item codes associated with this wholesale. And if we go back, we see that this 385 was found by applying the primary partial to the wholesale margins associated with tents. So we have this 385 number. Basically what we're saying is that we know that there's $385 million worth of wholesale margins attached to tents. We also know that there's three different item codes or three different stores that sell tents. And we need to be able to break out that $385 million worth of wholesale margins to the various different stores so we can properly allocate that margin value out. So that's going to be as simple as that 385 million that we uh, found previously multiplied by that weight that we just talked through. And that's going to give you the in scope satellite account value for this store's sales of tents, the wholesale margins that you're paying on it. And so these three lines right here will sum up the 385 million. We're just taking that 385 million and distributing it out to the right item codes. So we can properly account for the different margin or properties of the various different retail and wholesale stores or activities that we know are going on. So that is almost complete here. So the next step, once we've got that margin value properly allocated out to the right item codes, 
attached, we're still attached here to the, the sort of original item. So we know that there's this much margin value attached to tents within this margin item code. What we want to do now is sum this up by margin item code rather than breaking it out by this original item code. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to take the sum of all of the margins, the in scope margins here associated with this margin item code with, with one. So we'd sum this 275, this 493, et cetera, et cetera. So we get total in scope margins associated with this margin item code here. This one, this first item code is about $1.2 billion worth of in scope margins that are attached to that item code or they're associated with that item code. And so then now we're at the point where we can just take that simple um, route that we took for the one-to-one -one margin partials, and we can just divide this in scope margins by the total margins, the total margin output for the US economy, and we get a margin partial for this margin item code. Um, so that gives us, we have our primary partials that are attached to items and SAT activities. And then we've created our one-to-one -one margin partials for the transportation costs. And we've also created the one-to-many um, margin partials for the wholesale and retail. So we've properly allocated out all of our values here to generate output. We've got output of the items, and then we've also got the margins associated with the purchase of those items, all properly allocated out to the correct item codes. So now we can start generating actually generating output from the uh, BEA's database. So once we get these primary partials and the associated margin items, we can then apply the primary partial and the margin partials to the total item output from BEA's uh, core input output tables. And we can get in scope uh, satellite account or in scope marine economy satellite account output. Um, so, and that's just a very simple calculation here where we're just taking this primary partial or in the, excuse me, in the case of wholesale stores, we're taking this margin partial and applying it to total output. Um, so I will get in a little bit of detail into why we have this, what we call panel data um, here rather than just a total data. So this is the way that DEA uses uh, or stores its data to, be able to deflate things. Um, so P1Q1 right here, that's gonna be sort of the nominal value in the current year. So if this was 2019, this would be output in 2019. P0Q0 is the nominal value from the period before, from t time T minus one. So again, if this was 2019, this would be the nominal values in 2018. P0Q1 is quality adjusted. So the prices stayed the same from the 2018, but the, we've changed the uh, quantities here. P1Q0 is, P1, is 2019 prices, but 2018 quantities, if that makes sense. So I'm not gonna go too far into deflation. We can get into it in the question and answer if we like, but I just wanted to clarify what these, we just randomly decided to start having panels. So I thought I'd, I'd cover that. Um, so generating output, like I said, is a very straightforward process. We're taking the primary partial, we're applying it across the output data within BEA's database, and we're generating in scope output for the marine economy satellite account. So the full suite of estimates that we're trying to repair are output, intermediate inputs, value added, and then employment and compensation. So we've generated output, and we have output both by industry and by activity at this point. So we know which industries are producing which goods. Uh, we covered that from the supply table. So we know that if we have this tent, we know all of the various industries that are producing tents. So everywhere a tent is produced, we're gonna go in and apply this primary partial to it. That's why I wanted to bring up primary and secondary production in the previous session, because that can lead to some interesting results within the satellite account, where 
you're picking up value that is secondary production within an industry. I know that during, say, the outdoor recreation satellite account, one of the questions we got is why we had some very small values within hospitals. And the reason being for that is because we had some uh, secondary production of food and beverage services within hospitals that we were picking up. And so secondary production can often cause some, some unexpected results. Um, so here we have a very stylized um, example where we've got one industry producing one item here. But in fact, we know that we would have one industry producing a whole bunch of different items. And this item could be produced by several different industries as well. And so we would get the, we would get the total production um, of that. We would get everywhere that that is produced, we would be applying that primary partial to it. The next step here is to generate what we call an industry partial. So that is fairly straightforward. What we're going to do is we're going to take the in scope output that we just calculated and we're going to sum it by industry. Again, this is a relatively stylized uh, version of this. So right now we just have one industry producing one item. And so the sums are the same. But in reality, we know that sporting goods manufacturing is not producing just tents. In fact, they're producing a whole host of things, some of which are probably not in scope to the satellite account. And so we're going to take what is in scope for that industry and divide it by its total national output to get this industry ratio. And the reason we need that industry ratio is that we want to be able to generate intermediate inputs. And we don't have intermediate inputs by commodity. We don't know exactly what goes into producing every commodity. What we do have is intermediate inputs by industry. We know what the production function for an industry is on average. And so we want to be able to pull out the in-scope intermediate inputs, the intermediate inputs that went specifically into making just the in-scope satellite account activity. Um, so we need this industry ratio to do that. So once we have the industry ratio that we just calculated, we can apply that to total industry intermediates and we can get in scope intermediates. So that is an assumption that we're making here. And the assumption is that the intermediates consumed is the same for all items related to the satellite account or not. Um, for example, if we stick with my a previous fishing rod example, we're assuming that a fishing rod produced for use on the, on, in, in a marine environment will have the same on average production function as a fishing rod produced for fresh water. Uh, so for the most part, I think probably 90%, 95% of the time, that assumption is not too strong of an assumption. There are some edge cases where things get a little um, strange, but it's a, a very simplifying assumption for BEA's processing systems because we don't have to generate brand new supply use tables to make a satellite account. Instead, we can leverage the already existing national supply use tables that we put, you know, so much work into producing and just tease out the um, portions that we think are related to the satellite account in question. Just tease out the marine economy activity within those national supply use tables and in this route, if we do it this route, all of our identities still hold. Our gross output is less II is still equal to our value added and that our supply is still equal to our consumption. Um, so we've got gross output, we've got intermediate inputs. It's now time to generate value added. Um, so we're going to go back to that age old accounting identity that we talked about in the first session, which is that GO less II is equal to value added. So because we've got GO and II, we can generate value added estimates as well. And then finally, if we want, these are all in nominal terms at this point, but if we want to deflate these estimates, we can do what we call a double deflation methodology. So this is the same methodology that we use in the core accounts. And we're again, resting on that GO less II is equal to value added. So we're going to take deflated GO less deflated II, and that's going to give us a price adjusted value added, a real measure 
of value added activity for the satellite account. Um, so the reason that BEA does this methodology, just as a little bit of background, is that it's fairly difficult to find a proper price index for something like gross operating surplus or taxes on production. Um, it's not very simple to get a price index for taxes because they don't really follow any prices. Um, similarly, gross operating surplus is principally a measure of profits, and there's not really an easy way to say this is the price of profits. What we do have good price data on from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and elsewhere is the price of commodities, of goods and services. So gross output is in terms of commodities and intermediate inputs is also in terms of commodities. So we can deflate those with those price indexes that we do have and then fall back to that um, GO less II equals value added to get a version of value added that is deflated. Um, so that is a quick run through of a rather complicated system. That's really all I have to cover today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over and we can take any questions that might have arose um, throughout the presentation. Thank you, Connor, so much. Okay, I'm opening it up to the attendees. Please place your questions in that question panel. Um, while we wait for everyone to uh, furiously type those questions in, I do have one for you here. Could you please describe the review process that the calculations made for the satellite accounts go through, uh, partials, for example? Is the review process similar to that of the national economic accounts? Sure, definitely. Um, so yes, in short, the review process is similar. Um, Typically with a satellite account, we will have a meeting with um, some internal staff, what we call the North Americans Method Board, I believe, or NAM. Um, so those are the same group of people that are reviewing our national tables and any changes to the national methodology. We're going to present what we've done um, for both the, primarily for the satellite account team, what we're presenting is the direct research partial methodology. So we're presenting which source data we're using, which commodities we think are in scope, and how we're parsing out the in scope activity within that commodity. Um, so they're going to need to be able to sign off and say, yes, that looks like a good methodology before we can push forward. Um, similarly, sort of the processing system, which I think of as kind of separate from those direct research partials, um, it also went, underwent sort of the same review where we put something together, and, and took it to them and said, here's what we're doing, here's the assumptions we're making when we're making this system, um, and got the sign off there. Um, in terms of detailed review, um, so we're going to follow pretty much the same review as our national accounts, um, our, our GDP by industry statistics do. Um, so we're going to make sure that our identities are holding properly, that our chain values are following all of the rules that we need to, to follow for those chain values. You know, there's, there's some things that need to add up or, or need to sum to each other, or I guess multiply to each other rather in those chain values. Um, so there's a, a very rigorous review process for any of these accounts as, as anybody who's worked on will tell you, you know, we get the numbers ready probably at some points three months before we're actually slated to release. And then we're going through the review process where, you know, for the marine economy satellite account, we're taking it to BEA's internal executive staff, we're taking it to NOAA's executive staff, and getting the sign off from, from all of the interested parties uh, there. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, how was the employment and compensation developed for the satellite account? and how was the seasonal and part-time workers accounted for? Sure, so we take uh, BEA's estimates of employment and compensation by industry. Uh, so those are in full-time and part-time is what we're using there. And those are produced on the national level within the NIPAs. Um, for that, that's where we go back to that industry partial that we created to, to generate intermediate inputs. We also just apply that uh, industry partial to employment and compensation figures at our most detailed level. 
um, to generate the employment and compensation statistics. So again, we're, we're sort of resting on those national accounts or those core accounts, and we're using the industry partials that we created as a part of the processing system to tease out the employment that we think is associated with marine economy or whatever satellite account activity we're, we're trying to look at. Um, so that's, again, making the assumption that the production function for in-scope satellite account activity is, uh, on average, the same as a production scope uh, function for out-of-scope satellite activity within an industry. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. For satellite accounts in general, have there been significant uses in policy making that you are aware of? Um, sure. I think our satellite accounts are used by a whole host of people. Um, one of the probably the most policy making or, or government related that I've worked on has been the outdoor recreation satellite account. So a little bit of background on that. That was actually um, written into a bill that directed the BEA to create the outdoor recreation satellite account. Um, and so there was a large group of um, industry associations that kind of lobbied to get that in. And I've communicated personally with several offices of tourism and recreation on a state level that have been trying to leverage our um, outdoor recreation statistics to show how their region is you know, dependent on outdoor recreation or how important it is to their economy. And so we've communicated quite a bit about what our statistics are actually showing how best they could take that to various different policymakers to kind of advocate for outdoor recreation. So I think definitely there, there's a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of industry interest as well. But I think, um, you know, part of BEA's mission is to generate estimates that can be taken out and used in all sorts of different places. And I think policy is 100% uh, a part of that. Great, thanks. Our next question, is there documentation for the process used uh, supporting data studies to determine the shares that are in scope? Sure, um, so that's not necessarily always released to the public, um, but internally we have very detailed documentation about how we produced those direct research partials um, and, and make sure that we keep that as up to date as possible mostly just because it helps us down the line when you're looking at something and, and there's no documentation and you say, I don't know how we made this and you have to go digging. Um, so we, we try very hard to keep everything um, very detailed documentation. Um, I do believe that, and Jennifer can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe with this last uh, release for the Marine Economy Satellite Account, we did release not the detailed documentation that, that we take, but sort of a summary level about how we're splitting out various different activities and the data sources that we use to do so. Yes, Connor, I can confirm that. Uh, we, uh, on NOAA's side, we also have a detailed documentation on the, the partials that we created uh, to estimate the marine portion of each of the items. Um, yeah, that, that has not been published yet, but we're working on that to say uh, what, which part of it could be published to the public. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you both. Uh, next question. Could you please elaborate on how BEA and NOAA worked together on uh, MESA? Sure. It's been sort of a, it's definitely been a collaborative project um, and it's been sort of an ever evolving collaborative project where um, we started, I think, four years ago working together. Um, so there was a team from NOAA and then a team from BEA that sort of specialized in satellite accounts. And so primarily BEA was offering um, oversight and technical assistance about how our model works and NOAA was generating the, the majority of the direct research partials. Um, so over that process, they would generate research partials, we would generate some estimates, and then together we would review them and uh, sort of dig into the, the details there, um, and then slowly refine those direct research partials as we ran them through our system, and we noticed things that we might have been missing. 
Um, so it's, it's been a very good partnership, I think. Uh, I, I didn't know very much about the marine economy, to be quite honest, before I joined this project. Um, so that, that is probably one of the most fun parts of satellite accounts is getting to dig into this. And I think Noah's team was, was invaluable in, in offering that technical knowledge of what's going on in the marine economy and being able to, you know, whenever I would have a question, you know, is this actually something in the marine economy, they would just have an answer ready for me, um, which I always thought was, was fairly impressive because it was a very deep, you know, oftentimes a very deep, detail-oriented question. Great. Thank you, Connor. I am not seeing any further questions uh, unless someone is furiously typing at the moment. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Jennifer, do you want to highlight the next seminar and when that will be? Sure. Um, right now we have two other seminars confirmed. Um, one is uh, these two are all in October, but we are also reaching out to um, the implant experts and the uh, Remy model experts um, and expecting to have another two next month on the um, details of these two models. And that's all I have in line right now. And, and if you are interested in these webinars, and if you want to have uh, know some specific uh, uh, sense that you are interested in, feel free to contact me and I can work to add um, the topics to the webinars agenda. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and Connor. Uh, if you missed the first session that we had, I put that link all the way up in the top of the chat panel. You can also find it on the library's YouTube cha channel. This presentation was also recorded, so if you had to step away or if you would like to, uh, to review this at your leisure, or share it with a colleague, you will find it later today up on the library's YouTube channel. I don't see any further questions, so uh, everyone gets back a few more minutes of their day. I want to thank Connor and the um, the performance. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna botch this, Jennifer. The performance. What's what's your office? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Ah, the performance risk and social science office at NOAA. So sorry, everyone, for that. Uh, that okay. moment. Yes. <laughs> But thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe rest of your Thursday. Thank you for joining us.